she comes back and she is better than ever. I think you saw some experts say this week that the, the Brazilian gymnast who got silver, Rebecca Andrade, is better now than Simone Biles was when she won gold in the Olympics in 2016. That is how much the sport has progressed in the last eight years. And the fact that Biles is still the athlete that's in front of that is incredible. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of The Late Sub. I am your host, Claire Watkins. We're doing something a little bit different this week. It is Sunday evening, August 4th. We're taking a deep breath. We're talking about the first you know, 10 or so days of Olympic competition, some of the big breakout stars, some of the lessons learned, the golds won, the, the races lost. We're going to talk about team play that is still in progress, and then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the soccer tournament as we move into the crucial semifinal round on Tuesday. So much to get into. Let's dig in. All right. So we thought this week might be a nice time to sort of reflect on the first week, week and a half, if you count it, of Olympic competition. Take a deep breath after some of these events are over. I think people might know with the Olympic schedule, you may be, well, for example, you have one week of swimming and then one week of athletics. So the swimming is over as of this recording. Gymnastics team and all around is over, but they still are moving on on sort of the apparatus events. We've got the soccer tournament still going on, basketball still going on. We're in sort of that transitionary period of the Olympics where we have moved until the final week Things are about to be wrapping up. This past weekend, there was a ton of a ton of medal rounds, a lot of gold medals won by a variety of different athletes. But this is a good chance, I think, for us to sort of like sit down, deep breath, talk about the big moments of the first week of the games, because I don't want this stuff to get lost. We're probably going to be talking about some of the, the big picture stuff. We're going to miss some things because there's so much going on and there is going to probably be a little bit of a U.S. focus here just because that is sort of what we're all sort of honed in on here in the States. But I, I mean, it's safe to say I've really enjoyed the Olympics so far. I think the Peacock coverage has been very good. The time zone has been very friendly for me here in Chicago. Putting on multi-view, putting on the gold, the gold like wraparound show has been really nice. If you want to hone in on one particular sport, you can. I have really felt this year like I have been able to follow everything that I want to follow and if I miss something, <laughs> you know, if there was something that was going on at three o'clock in the morning, my time, I can go back and I can rewatch it if I want to, or there are some things that you let go, but you're hitting all the big stories. I've just really, really enjoyed the Paris Olympics so far. I think that the host, both city and nation has done a wonderful job. I think we've seen athletes look really comfortable, have had a really good time. I also feel kind of lucky from a women's sports lens, this Olympic games, and this is maybe indicative, you know, it's possible that this has always been true and I'm only just focused on the now, or if this does maybe point to a new era of longevity, perhaps in women's sport, that so many of the superstars kind of coming out of the first week of this games are the ones we were talking about at the very beginning, right? We have these multi-Olympic superstars who are sort of woven into the conversation of sports in this country beyond just every four years, or if maybe every four years or the Olympics is their shining moment, they are names that we know. These are stories that have been told over four, eight, 12 years. And I think that that's really exciting because I think that kind of storytelling across Olympics is not something that we have always had in women's sports where people haven't always had the vocabulary to discuss history in this sense. You know, I'm obviously talking about an athlete like Simone Biles, an athlete like Katie Ledecky, Suni Lee, Shakari Richardson, Asia Wilson. These stars are known going in and you always want to go in and see the big names perform. And sometimes they do, or sometimes they don't. And we met some athletes that we also were very happy to sort of meet through these games. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I just like this moment that women's sports are in, in, in part of this larger conversation in a variety of different sports, even just in the States, like, you know, the conversation about women's basketball and fans who are arriving and don't know the history or women's soccer, who you have fans who are kind of two different kinds of fans who maybe are in the day in day out of a team like, or a league like NWSL, but only pay attention to the U S women's national team every four years or true casuals who are just meeting this new U S women's national team for the first time, because some of those known stars are no longer on the team. It feels, I mean, sports are always ever shifting in this way and sort of the passing of 
the guard. Um, an athlete like Katie Ledecky, an athlete like Simone Biles is probably closer to the end of their Olympic career than the beginning. And you see that turnover and you see that legacy kind of be be given to, to new swimmers or, or to new gymnasts. But the fact that we know them so well already, I think is a testament to sort of where women's sports are in this moment. And I think there's also just so much more to grow. I am going to just start with what I think is truly the biggest story of competition in the first week, especially in the United States, which was gymnastics, U.S. gymnastics and, and Simone Biles comeback after having to withdraw from the team in the all around event in Tokyo due to struggling with the twisties, which as people know is, I always describe it kind of as like a mental injury. I don't ever want to say like, it was just like feelings or, or something that could be overcome. She was having, she was having an injury sort of in the way of her process of visualizing that made it unsafe for her to compete. She has to pull out in Tokyo. She comes back in Paris in 2024 and becomes the only U.S. gymnast to take two Olympic individual all-around golds. She's also the first women's gymnast to take gold in the all-around individual all-around in two non-consecutive Olympic games. She is the Olympic all-around champion in 2016 and in 2024. She is the most decorated U.S. gymnast of all time with seven gold medals, one silver and two bronze. She actually has the opportunity to add to that total later this week. She, she is the, she's the GOAT. She is the greatest American gymnast of all time. She's arguably the greatest women's gymnast of all time. I think that's an argument that perhaps people with more expertise can, can argue probably deeper. But this comeback story is almost so remarkable that it's difficult to process because Biles makes it look so pedestrian. And it's not even just that she came back. You know, comeback stories we know. I think a really good comeback story, maybe in the context of Biles, is that of Tokyo all-around gold medalist Suni Lee, who Lee, you know, she talked this week actually about feeling imposter syndrome this year. She wins the gold medal in the all-around in Tokyo in Biles' absence. That is the big story brewing around that gold medal, rather than it just being like Suni Lee wins gold. It was always sort of in the context of Biles pulling out. In the years since, she has overcome two kidney disease diagnoses to be here. She's silenced doubters about her place on the team after the U.S. suffered a number of major injuries in Olympic trials before the games even began. Lee comes back to win team all-around gold, and she has two bronze, one in the all-around individual and one in the uneven bars. That is a comeback story that feels so nicely grounded in what we saw Lee do in Tokyo and what we saw her do in Paris. I think it's a fabulous story. I, I was talking about this all week about how I just can't even think too hard about Suni Lee without getting emotional. I'm so happy to see the games that she had. She had been, you know, people talked about how maybe she was more of an apparatus specialist. Again, she's probably, she is the best American at uneven bars. Then to come back and make all around bronze in, in a consecutive Olympics, I think that's the first time that an athlete has made the podium twice in the all around in a very long time in a row in, in, in a very long time. So that is like a story that you can contextualize and understand. And, and I love the story of Suni Lee. The story of Simone Biles, though, almost takes it one step further, which is that she is 27 years old, which in old norms for gymnastics is, is much older than I think she even probably ever anticipated still doing elite gymnastics. The norms of the, of the sport are slowly beginning to change in part because of Biles, not only in her ability, but the way that she and her fellow athletes have fought for healthier standards for athletes in gymnastics, changing the culture of, of training and sort of the, the churn of athletes in gymnastics. They were criticized for that in some ways. Uh, this year, there was a, a notable peer of theirs who, who implicated or implied that because of the safety measures in place for gymnasts after the hugely toxic environment of USA Gymnastics in the past, and obviously the Larry Nasser case, that it's that standards were slipping. Biles has had to carry a lot of that with her in addition to just pushing the sport forward. She comes back and she is better than ever. I think you saw some experts say this week that the, the Brazilian gymnast who got silver, Rebecca Andrade, is better now than Simone Biles was when she won gold in the Olympics in 2016. That is how much the sport has progressed in the last eight years. And the fact that Biles is still the athlete that's in front of that is incredible. She lands the Yurchenko double pike. She has a big hop in the all-around competition, but she I, looked like possibly the best she's ever stuck it in the vault competition, which is her most recent gold on that apparatus, which she is 
obviously incredible at. She's the best in the world. She is still pushing the sport forward. And so it would be one thing if this was a comeback where she is just as good as she was in the past, or it's just because of the story that she, that you, you want to follow her and you want to root for her. But to come back and be on top and make it as comfortable as it was, she had one big mistake in the all-around competition on uneven bars and was able to come past that in the beam and the floor. Incredible. Just incredible. There are no words, no words really, for what Biles has achieved. Again, you know, I now that the Olympics are over for some athletes, people are already talking about what comes next. And as we know, what comes next in the Summer Olympics is L.A., in my take, I'm going to make my pitch. Here's my pitch. This is my pitch for Simone Biles. This is my pitch for Katie Ledecky. It's for anyone who wants to hear it, which is if you are still one of the best Americans in your sport by the time LA rolls around, I think you should go for it. I think you should go for it. But yeah, I love to see Simone Biles get her shining moment. Incredible ratings for for the, for the, the team event and the all-around, individual all-around for gymnastics. Love to see that. Very, very proud of that group. We can maybe talk about, let's move on to the other big storyline of the first week, which is the battle of the pool. We talked about this a little bit last week about how there was this this rivalry, friendly but simmering, let's say, between the United States and Australia. There was this tension going in on whether or not the U.S. would fail to win the most Olympic golds in swimming for the first time in a very long time, if Australia could make the leap to surpass them. There was a little bit of crosstalk between some Australian swimmers and the American swimmers. You know, they're Australian swimmers, you know, they were saying the Americans are loud. You know, they come in with the cowbell. People saw Katie Ledecky today on Sunday with the cowbell. And, and you know, they they do have a little bit of an edge and they want to they want to humble the Americans a little bit. And then America comes back in and they go, OK, well, we're just going to make the cowbell even louder. We're going to be more obnoxious. We're going to be rooting. We're going to do the best we possibly can. The U.S. does vary by a very slim margin. They do hold the most gold medals in swimming in Paris with eight Six of them were won at least in part by women's swimmers. One of the golds was a mixed gendered relay. It was not an amazing meet for the U.S. I think I'll leave it to somebody else to talk about some of the struggles that the men's side had, but you had some individuals. I mean, we're going to talk about the breakout meet of, of Canada's summer Macintosh. You have Ariana Titmus, who was the rival to Katie Ledecky, and they kind of got the best of better of each other, kind of split the difference in their two swims against each other. I think we saw the, the running joke after a couple of days was just that the U.S. was doing an incredible job of getting silver, was struggling a little bit more to win. But the U.S. women really hard carried. They, they did a really nice job, especially at the end, the final swim of the entire meet was the one that got the U.S. that eighth gold. It was punctuated by a world record in the 4 by 100 individual medley relay. Or not individual, but just a medley relay. Really fun. Really fun meet. Going to Ledecky specifically, I think as we mentioned last time, she she did not, she got third, but she falls to Titmus in the 400 freestyle. She goes on to fully dominate in the 1500 freestyle and then the big race was the 800 meter freestyle, which is sort of that meeting in the middle of the two distances question of who's going to be the dominant swimmer. Ledecky does win. It's her fourth consecutive 800 meter freestyle win. So she's won that event in four consecutive Olympic games, still not ruling out the possibility of LA in 2028, perhaps in the 1500, which is her dominant event. Again, how do you even contextualize what we're seeing? You want to be like, this was a great game for, for these athletes, but also to say we are witnessing some of the best American Olympians of all time. Katie Ledecky, Simone Biles. Ledecky comes home as the sole holder of most medals for an American women's sports athlete at the Olympic Games. Historic, generational. Other big breakout stars, Tori Hoos had a fabulous game for the United States. She wins three golds and two silvers. Uh, she... Again, she sort of has this anchor. She was the anchor on two gold medal winning relays. Fabulous game from hers. I mentioned Canada's summer Macintosh. She's 17 years old. She wins three golds and one silver in her first ever Olympic Games, including a barn burner in the 200 IM. I think you can call her the best all around swimmer in the world right now with many, many years to come of very good swimming. And then I also just want to shout out Katie Douglas, who I thought had a very, very good meet as well. I, I loved the I loved the swimming this year. It was it was a little bit, people were talking about how the pool was slow because the pool was a little bit shallow. So there was too much sort of turbulence in the water, but you also saw the athletes start to acclimate to it. You saw more world records fall, you saw two world records fall in, in the last day of competition. It was cool to see some slow starts, perhaps from the U S swimming team, have them make it up in those final couple of days of competition. Very, very compelling. 
love to see it. Um, there'll be many more things on the track to discuss next week, but swim meet was fabulous. Moving on now to some team sports, and then we're going to get into maybe some of our surprises or like our, our newcomer awards. USA basketball, I think people never know exactly what to expect. Well, they know what to expect with USA women's basketball, but always the question of how much of pool play is exciting. You know, how is the U.S. going to dominate? How do we follow along? The 5v5 team has looked as dominant as ever, if a little choppy. I mean, the big thing with USA basketball teams is that they – do not get a lot of time together. You know, if you're a fan of maybe the U.S. women's national soccer team, you know how often they come together during FIFA international breaks to train. They pulled out of the NWSL with a couple of weeks to go before the Olympics so that they could train together. USA basketball, it's not the same. Everyone recalls exactly when the WNBA All-Star game was. The U.S. was training up until that week, but... They don't do that sort of thing that we're used to in soccer, where if you're in a summer league, you maybe pull out a little bit early so that you're able to build cohesion and chemistry. The U.S. is, is based on talent, and it's sort of about wrangling that talent into something that can execute over teams that have more time together throughout the year. I think, you know, France is a really good example. They've done quite well in pool play as well, but they have had a lot more training time together. They have three wins in three. The U S does in their pool play. They finished first in the group, Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart. It's a, they're dominating, dominating. I think ultimately, you know, one of the I think people go, why is the U S why is the U S never lost an Olympic game since 1992? Why is the U S the heavy favorite for gold when they do have some of these structural things that don't lead them to have the best ability to play as a team all the time. And you go, well, we've got Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart, you know, they got Alyssa Thomas, they got Sabrina Unescu, they got Jackie Young, they got Kalia Copper, they got Diana Taurasi. They have those athletes and it's wave after wave after wave. And even if you start strong against the U.S., you're going to just struggle to finish strong against them. So they've done really well. 3v3 basketball, though, has had a bit of a weird journey for the U.S. women's national team. Uh, they start the Olympics 0-3. And they come back to rattle off four straight wins to launch themselves into the semifinals. This is coming out on Monday. That game might already be decided, but we can at least say a really rough start, but then they turn it around and they're going to be playing for a medal no matter what. 3v3, you know, I talk about the 5v5 having these things that limit their ability to build chemistry, to play a little bit more like a team and or, or maybe, you know, run the offensive actions that, that Cheryl Reeve would like them to run or be able to know their defensive assignments like the back of their hand. 3v3, it's like that, but it's a different sport. So not only does the 3v3 team not have a lot of time together and they were impacted by an injury to LA Sparks rookie Cam Brink, who is supposed to be on this team. She was replaced by Derricka Hamby. Ryan Howard is on the team in Paris, but she did not play a lot in the WNBA leading up to it because she was dealing with an ankle injury so they have some individual things that they were working out even just in sort of injury rotation and they just are not that experienced in 3v3 they you know you're pulling these 5v5 these WNBA players into this 3v3 format anchored I want to shout out Sierra Burdick though who is the one 3v3 veteran on the team you can tell how much they rely on her during these games they do like huddle timeouts there's the coaches are not very involved in breaks in play in the 3v3 games and you can tell how much Burdick is is helping and is analyzing the game and is helping her teammates through you know they had Haley Van Lith who is in an off season right she's an NCAA athlete so she was not even really playing games all the way up until the Olympics so 3v3 is a different sport the United States does not have top athletes participating in 3v3 necessarily year round. You have to participate in a certain number of 3v3 tournaments to even qualify for an Olympic team. So I understand why the U.S. had a slow start here. I am curious if USA basketball ever takes a different approach to have the teams be a little bit better prepared. But, you know, it's it's one out. Talent has one out so far when they have come back with this winning streak. And I'm really happy to see that because I think that those players, especially a player like perhaps Haley Van Lith, right, who, who was very known for kind of getting lit up by Caitlin Clark in the NCAA tournament. And then she comes back and she's playing in the Olympics and they're struggling. You just, you know, these, these athletes deserve to have a little bit of joy too. So happy to see all of that from 3v3. Curious to see how that ends up. And if it does kind of change the approach by USA Basketball or if they kind of keep running with what they've been doing. Talking about athletics, track and field, which really just has just begun. But in the first weekend of track and field, you do get the 100 meter sprint. I, I think the reason they do that is because they don't, because they, they do that because they do want the best sprinters to participate in the relays. And those sprinters would have to decide if they wanted to participate in the relays if they had that event coming later because they don't want to get injured, right? Or they don't want to get uh, fatigued. So 
Shakari Richardson, she earned silver in the 100 meter sprint. It's like I said, it's been kind of that kind of a games for the the speed events for the United States. Total, I think maybe, you know, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of people, at least casuals, like I would consider myself a track and field casual, were surprised by the the gold medal winner, who was Julian Alfred of St. Lucia, first ever gold medal for St. Lucia. You, you could see the videos of everyone back home just losing their minds when Alfred takes gold. That's a fabulous story of the games. Yeah, I Richardson, I mean, I, I feel, again, sort of for an athlete like Richardson who didn't get the opportunity to participate in what would have been her first Olympic Games in Tokyo. But again, I like that she is known. She just wasn't running as fast as she was at the World Championships. She was about two tenths of a second off of her World Championship pace in in Tokyo or in in Paris in the preliminary rounds. Alfred seizes the day. Really cool race. I love the hundred meter. And then again, the newcomers, the stories you don't expect. You find yourself on Peacock and you're watching MultiView and you're watching a a horse do a dance and you're watching surfing in Tahiti at the same time and you're watching beach volleyball underneath the Eiffel Tower and you're trying to learn the rules of the sport and the names and having a blast. I mean, I think some of the obvious ones, Rugby Sevens had a huge moment in the first week of the games. Alona Meyer, probably one of like the breakout stars of the entire Olympics. I've seen some rugby enthusiasts like say that they hope that maybe this turns into the rugby kind of 1999ers moment when the USA, because they won bronze in the rugby sevens event, which is absolutely punching above their weight. The U S is not necessarily known as a huge power in rugby. It was a walk off upset win of Australia in the bronze medal match. You know, I think everybody was watching because they were excited about rugby sevens. You see, you think the U S is about to, you know, do a hard fought, hard fought loss to a, a nation that is much more established in rugby. And then they get the walk off in what, you know, we would call, I mean, I, again, using like soccer terms or like second half stoppage time, they take the win with the extra kick. Really cool. I, I think that there are, there is domestic rugby in the United States. You can go see these athletes participate in the United States. There is always the hope that, that, that sort of that equivalent of the 99ers moment, or you watch a sport like soccer in the Olympics, Americans love the Olympics. Can they translate that into some momentum back home? Hope to see that for rugby. Even just today, Kristen Faulkner, the American in the road race, the cycling road race. I'm not a huge cycling enthusiast, but I love to watch it during the Olympics. And again, just that course in Paris, fabulous. Like the French countryside and the French, you know, the infrastructure of the city has really been showing off during these Olympics and thrilling, thrilling end to the road race. You had these, these heavy favorites from other, other nations, again, who are a little bit more powers week in and week out in, in women's cycling. Kristen Faulkner sprint at the end runs away from the competition. Huge underdog win again, under the Eiffel tower, iconic love to see it mentioned fencing again, fencing also a sport that you're kind of learning the rules along the way. The U S women do very, very well. Lee Kiefer earns two golds. Lauren Scruggs helps close out the team gold. Really exciting. Fabulous to watch again, newcomers, and that is what the Olympics is all about. And so maybe just my final thought for this first, yeah, the first, you know, let's say, you know, couple of first week, first 10 days of the Olympics is I, I go back and forth on how I feel about in retrospect to the Tokyo Olympics. I think that you, you have them because it's really hard not to have them, but th- that was hard on the athletes, right? It was really hard on these athletes, hard on their families, the Beijing Olympics who that came after also, I think very hard in those same ways where I just think about how refreshing it is now watching these athletes get to celebrate with their loved ones or have cheers in the stands when someone is, is swimming or someone is playing basketball or the gymnastics, just the camaraderie of sport is something that was missing a little bit through, through necessity at the Tokyo Olympics. And it has just been very, very nice to see that come back in Paris. So All I can say is that for some of this stuff, I know what I'm talking about. For some of this, I am just a fan, but let me fangirl out a little bit because this has been a really enjoyable Olympics thus far, and I'm very excited for the next week. And then now let's switch over to the soccer field, back to the soccer field. We've been doing a lot of U.S. Women's National Team focused work over the last, again, 10 days of competition, going all the way back to that that group stage opener that the U.S. played and that all the other teams played before the opening ceremonies even began. The semifinals are set. You know, this is coming out on Monday. We're recording this on Sunday evening. It's going to be two rematches. Scary 
that terrifies me to be completely honest for all of these teams, either you're going to lose to a team twice in the same games, or you're going to beat them in group play when it matters less and then fall when it matters most. So the United States is going to be a rematch of their Germany game, United States versus Germany in the first semifinal. And then the second semifinal is going to be a rematch of Spain versus Brazil. That's right. My prediction has already been blown up. France is out. That's probably the biggest upset of the quarterfinal round. A quarterfinal round that saw the United States defeat Japan in extra time. That saw Spain come back to uh, to equalize after being down two goals against Colombia. They go all the way through extra time. They finish 2-2. Spain advances on penalties. Canada and Germany cannot find a goal between them. All the way through extra time also goes to penalties. Germany advances past Canada. So there will be, if not a new, a, a brand new Olympic champion, first time Olympic champion, there will be a new one. Canada is out. And then Brazil is the only game to finish in regulation when Brazil nabs a late goal against France to win one to nothing. The emotions there, we'll maybe start there and then work our way back. Brazil, France, it was a good game. It was much more wide open. France was knocking on the door and they just couldn't find the breakthrough. Brazil, you could see the emotions pouring out after that game because of Marta, who I think, as we mentioned before, was suspended with a red card. She is going to be out for the semifinal as well. But with that magic number win, right, of the quarterfinal, she is now guaranteed to get to play in the team's medal game. Whether that is for gold or for bronze remains to be seen. And, and that game got chippy. It got very frustrated on both sides. Brazil, the masters of, of slowing things down when they need to and speeding things up when they need to. France perennially the bridesmaid and not the bride. They go out in the quarterfinal round regularly in major tournaments, despite looking very formidable going in. I really thought France could pull it together. I mean, I, I was on record. I thought that France was going to have a better tournament than they did. And it's so hard to gauge what exactly goes wrong, right? You can say, you know, the team relies too much on aging stars. They did have some older players on this roster, players that we know quite well, Eugenie Le Sommer or Amandine Henri, you could say that, or, or Wendy Renard, but... Those are the best players available. You could say that it's an issue of attack, but they had Marie Antoinette Cototo, who had a really good group stage. But I mean, ultimately, I think what, what killed France was the inability to close things out, right? We saw them almost collapse against Colombia in, in their first game. They lose to Canada late in their second game. And, and they have, you know, they have a good game against New Zealand, but they do concede against New Zealand. So it was it starts to feel again and again and again, like the story of France is mental. And I don't know what the solution is for them. You can have the most talented players in the world, but if they mentally cannot get over that hurdle, I don't know exactly what you do. They're going to have a new permanent full-time coach in the future because their, their, perf their current head coach has said that he is moving on. I feel for France. I, as always, I, I always have such high expectations for them going in, but they just really struggle with the mental and physical elements of tournament play. Uh, Canada versus Germany. We say goodbye to Canada. You know, anybody who felt like they shouldn't be in the tournament because of the drone spying scandal, they do not ultimately go on. They do not ultimately go on to be able to play for a medal. So maybe that all kind of works out in a karmic way, perhaps. Maybe Canada, after having their backs against the wall for game after game after game, finally run out of gas. That was excuse me, that was a game of missed opportunities. Both teams could have gotten a goal that, you know, if you look at two different nil nil results at the end of regulation, the one between the United States and Japan, you go, that feels about right. The one between Canada and Germany, you felt like it could have been done and dusted long before the final whistle blew, but was not to be. So no goals there. Germany has had a really interesting games. They, they dominate Australia. They really struggle against the United States. They dominate Zambia. And then they kind of play to this neutral against Canada but they looked great in the penalties and Katrine Berger, the GOAT. Well, maybe not the GOAT. I mean, it'll be fascinating to see if she and Alyssa Nair have to handle penalties against each other in the semifinal because they are the two the two goalkeepers out here who are used to sinking them and saving them. Um, I think we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. I think that's a scary matchup for the United States. Just rematches are hard. Spain looked very human in their game against Colombia. They were down two to nothing for a long stretch of the game. They have to come back, I think, in 12 minutes of regulation plus stoppage time to score two goals. 
feel so badly for Colombia who were forced into some substitutions that I think affected their ability to go forward. They were just desperate defending by the end there. They are like, honestly, a heroic performance to take it all the way to penalties and not to lose an extra time. Spain kind of, they advanced through the skin of their teeth. Um, they are still alive. Maybe a, a, a slight humbling moment for the reigning world champions will be interesting to see if they carry that sort of lesson in through the medal rounds. But that was almost one of like the great all-time Olympic upsets in, in the women's football tournament, but they do make it through. And then we, we talked about this a lot on YouTube. If you're not subscribed to the Just Women's Sports YouTube channel, I really recommend it. The United States beats Japan one to nothing in extra time. I think in the context of the greater quarterfinal round, huge kudos to the United States for even finding that goal so that they did not have to go to penalties because it did kind of seem like that was where that game was headed. So like I said, Rematch city here, Brazil and Spain, United States and Germany. Like I said, rematches are, are nervy. They're, they're kind of scary. I, I, th it has, they, we have seen in the past teams beat other teams in the group stage and go on to lose to those teams in the knockout rounds. Group A after the quarterfinal round had been completely eliminated. So for the neutral, maybe not so exciting, but maybe you see a different result, right? Maybe you do see a galvanized Brazil up against a Spain that has started to see some of the unique difficulties of the Olympic tournament. Maybe you do see the United States and Germany have to play a much more defensive-minded game after more of that shootout that they were in in the group stage. Because I do think going into these semifinals, for better or for worse, it's going to be an issue of fatigue. All of these games, except for Brazil's and France's game, went into extra time. But that game had about 18 extra minutes of second half stoppage. So, like, they essentially had at least one half of extra time in that match. These players are tired. This format is grueling. They were not, none of these teams were able to do themselves huge favors to get out of the quarterfinal round quickly. And so we might just not see a ton of goals. I think it's going to be about who can remain mentally compact, who can remain defensively sound, who can maybe have that moment of individual brilliance like we saw from Trinity Rodman against Japan. Maybe this will go to penalties. I mean, we saw how many penalty shootouts existed in, in, the, in the Tokyo Olympics. But yeah, I, I think, I think this is all just about who wins. We can do a lot of soccer analysis and we'll continue to do so, but this is where the Olympics is all just kind of about guts, guts to glory. Right. So excited for these games. I think in terms of success, right? I think all four teams should be very happy with how this tournament played out United States in sort of this transition year with a new manager and, and a, a very young new group in this roster. You've got Germany who have some absences due to injury that I think really recontextualized their ceiling for this tournament. You have Spain where it's probably gold or bust in terms of success, which is not the easiest burden to bury. And then you've got Brazil who are playing for Marta. They want to send her out after that game against France. You saw them. They were waving to Marta. They were making the, the crown gesture on their heads. They were putting up heart hands. They really want to send their icon out on a medal. This is good. I think it's a good mix. Like I said, not necessarily exciting in terms of new matchups, but I do think it's a good mix. I'm going to do my predictions again, and people can, man, if I do this, it means it's not going to happen, but I'm going to do it. I think we're going to go two for two in the team that won the first match, winning the second as well. I do think Spain is going to advance past Brazil. And then I think the United States is going to find a way past Germany. But that one might go to pens. I think the, the U.S. fans have to be very prepared for that to go long. So I'm redoing my medal round predictions. And I'm going to say, this is what, is it wish, is it like wish casting a little bit? Maybe I think still, I think I'm, I'm switching back to Spain gold. I'm listening to the people back to Spain gold, United States silver. I'm going to say it, Brazil bronze. Marta goes out on a win. She gets a bronze medal. Everyone is happy. Beautiful soccer tournament. So the semifinals are taking place on Tuesday. We will be doing wrap up work immediately after those games end. Talk about the United States, win or lose. So like I said, please subscribe to the Just Women's Sports YouTube channel for more of that. We have a lot of other good video work coming out about the games themselves and about soccer specifically. We've been having a blast and I think it's just more, more to do this week. So that has been this week's edition of The Late Sub. I'm your host, Claire Watkins. Shout out to producer extraordinaire Parker Fenton. We'll have so much more for you with this upcoming week. We're going to be talking about Olympic golds, Olympic silvers, Olympic bronze, wins, losses, highs, lows. And then once this all wraps up, 
we're going to be turning back to these domestic leagues because the WNBA is back in practice and the NWSL is uh, they've wrapped up their summer league group play. So there's, there's stuff, always stuff to talk about. I've enjoyed the Olympics so much so far. Thank you all for hanging out. Subscribe to the Just Women Sports YouTube channel. And we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.